let's face it. Today's connected embedded systems are nothing short of a balancing act. Keeping your connectivity, power concerns, design flexibility, and security requirements in alignment can be quite a challenge. Man, seesaws were way more fun when I was a kid. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. For today's modern embedded designs, a great solution to help keep all of our design requirements in balance is a dual-core MCU. In today's Chalk Talk, Patrick Kennedy from NXP joins me to discuss why newer design requirements for today's connected embedded systems are making this balancing act even harder than before, and how the IMX RT1170 can help solve these problems with its heterogeneous dual cores, MIPI interface, multi-core low-power strategy, and SRAM puff technology that can make all the difference in your next embedded design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're talking about the IMX RT1170 today, but Patrick, before we get started, what kind of challenges are you seeing in this space today? In terms of, of modern embedded systems, really they're increasingly needing to support smart, connected, and interactive devices, right? When this is in addition to previous generation requirements, basically meaning that we have our existing requirements that include things like energy efficiency, low power, and really low cost. Right? Everyone's always looking to be as low cost as possible. In addition to uh, really new groundbreaking requirements in terms of things like connectivity, which is usually multimodal, so both wireless and wired, as well as enhanced multimedia, which could include things like voice control and graphics. And then finally, some aspects of enhanced security, as well as even things like machine learning, right? Whether that's being performed on incoming sensor data, image data, or even multimedia. The example I like to give, at least as a, as a cursory example, but really this extends to a lot of really existing devices, is the development of the smart speaker. The speakers have been around for a really long time. Most of us are familiar with them. And it's only recently that they've been starting to have these new additional features and functions and capabilities that right now we all kind of take for granted, but it's really a big shift from the entire history of speakers, right? So rather than just having something that plays sound and we, we focus on the sound fidelity, the quality, all that kind of stuff, we start adding things like cloud connectivity, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, voice control. I've even seen a lot of portable speakers that have all of those functionalities, plus they have basically reactive light shows on the device as well. So ultimately it comes down to um, how do we balance these new requirements with the existing cost constraints along with power and speed? That makes sense. So in terms of performance and low power, which are incredibly important requirements, like you mentioned, what does the IMX RT1170 bring to the table in particular? The IMX RT1170 really brings performance and low power through what is basically a heterogeneous dual core microcontroller architecture. So in terms of high performance, it actually has a Cortex M7 running up to one gigahertz clock frequency, which can be used more for computationally heavy aspects of a system. While it also contains a, a Cortex M4 running up to 400 megahertz, which can be used to focus on more control functions, if you will, that are, are more typical of these existing devices. And additionally includes actually a heterogeneous graphics processing system, which includes a 2D GPU, so meaning you can run vector graphics on the chip, as well as a pixel pipeline processing, you know, which basically just includes various hardware acceleration for graphics functionality. So in terms of performance, really, it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to pick the right core for the right job in your application. So meaning we could first, for example, boot up with the, the Cortex M7 and then enable the Cortex M4 when you need to do some sort of sensor fusion, voice detection, or customized communication protocol. And then on the other hand, we could also boot the Cortex M4 first, and that will control the entire system and it will basically function as a secure subsystem and could additionally perform some basic uh, system housekeeping, if you will, making sure the system is stable and kept in check and then we can enable the Cortex M7 when we need some higher levels of computation, such as for UI maintenance, machine learning, 
and other computationally heavy aspects. What is interesting on the low power side is that the Cortex M4, which we'll get into the, the details of the two CPU cores a little bit later, but it's really optimized for low power. It can stay alive when the DC-DC is off. It can really be fully isolated from the Cortex M7 through something called the Resource Domain Control or RDC system controller. So this basically means that you can isolate both of these cores and their associated resources from one another, which basically brings a lot of flexibility to the design in tackling these high performance but low power requirements that we just discussed so that you can pick the right core and the right set of peripherals for each core as needed. That makes sense. Now, design flexibility is also an important aspect of most embedded designs today as well, right? It's almost one of the the most uh, important aspects of designing systems today, simply because we're always seeing new features being added to devices, right? Gone are the days a lot of the time where you have just a product that you ship and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Nowadays, we are shipping really OEMs and ODMs and our customers are shipping products that are living, breathing things. They're no longer just a product. A lot of the time, it's a platform that you can build off of, that you can interact with your customer every day. One of the things that we hear from current customers for the 1170 is really the level of flexibility it provides kind of makes it a Swiss army knife of embedded systems for a lot of the reasons I just mentioned. Basically being that it can provide both high performance and low power efficiency, as well as a high degree of of security and, and really integrity in dealing with these problems. And because of the dual core heterogeneous architecture, As I mentioned before, you can really flexibly choose basically which core you need for each function of your application and keep them separate, if that makes sense. It sure does. Now, Patrick, can we take a closer look specifically at the Cortex M7 part of the IMX RT1170? Yeah, sure. So the implementation of the Cortex M7 on the RT1170, it's really actually, at least at the the time of recording this, is the highest performing Cortex M7 really on the market. It operates up to one gigahertz clock frequency, up to 2,430 dry stone MIPS, 5,070 core mark. Um, so as you can tell, it's, it's really, in terms of performance and speed, it really is, is state of the art as of today. So really what this enables is ultra fast interrupt latency all the way down to 12 nanoseconds with up to 218 interrupt sources or four interrupt levels. And the power efficiency of the device is still relatively good, right? So we can basically achieve less than 100 microamps per megahertz power consumption. And it additionally supports dynamic voltage frequency scaling, or DVFS, meaning that we can scale the the frequency of the voltage as needed for lower power operation, or if we don't quite need that level of high performance at certain times of operation. It's also highly reliable providing support for ECC on L1 cache and the tightly coupled memory. And it also contains a large L1 cache, which includes 32 kilobytes of instruction and data cache. And then finally, it includes a really highly configurable TCM or uh, tightly coupled memory, as I mentioned before, which is up to 512 kilobytes. And basically what this guarantees is a zero weight cycle access to really what you can choose as being a, a certain amount of instructions or data. So meaning we can really have a high performance and responsive system. It also includes support for single and double precision uh, floating point operations. And finally, a memory protection unit up to 16 regions of memory. So Patrick, what about that Cortex M4? So the the Cortex M4 is actually almost equally uh, as impressive, although not as, let's say not as groundbreaking necessarily, but it is really a high performance Cortex M4 on the RT1170. It runs up to 400 megahertz clock frequency at 544 dry stone MIPS, or up to 1,398 core mark. Still a relatively fast interrupt latency, down to 30 nanosix, nanoseconds interrupt latency, uh, with again up to 218 interrupt sources and up to four interrupt levels. But the really main thing I want to focus on for the Cortex M4, and it's really important, is the, the power efficiency it can provide, right? So... Compared to the the Cortex M7, where it was around 100 microamps per megahertz power consumption, the Cortex M4 is really less than 30 microamps per megahertz. So meaning that it really is optimized for low power and can really provide a lot of flexibility in, in designing for low power, which really can't be understated 
for really a variety of devices. A lot of times when people talk about low power, it's really in the context of portable devices, but we're seeing more and more devices, even with things like Energy Star, right, for appliances, which while it is something you plug into your wall, right, it's still very important to maintain low power for those devices, which isn't necessarily something people always consider (laughs) just because it's not, uh, you know, something that fits in your pocket. Beyond the power efficiency provided for the Cortex M4, it also includes its own L1 cache and TCM that both have parity check on the L1 cache and ECC support to provide a high degree of reliability. Okay, so Patrick, can you show us a real life example of this in action? Sure, yeah. So the example that I like to point to really is the use case of the e-scooter, which I'm sure uh, most people are familiar with. Either you've ridden one or tripped over one on the sidewalk because it's in the way. To kind of give you an idea of what this dual core heterogeneous architecture enables, we can first look at a typical system of an e-scooter, right? Which might contain a battery pack, for example, which will have a control unit on it. So some kind of microcontroller. In this case, I put one of the LPC 55 1X devices. And then you'll also have an ECU, which will contain a separate microcontroller that that will basically do all of the, the motor control functionality that might verify the integrity of, say, the battery pack and to authenticate that the battery pack being used is in fact reliable and perhaps even from a certain manufacturer. And then lastly, you might have something that is more of the e-scooter digital cluster, right? This is where things like the display are handled. You might have some kind of payment system set up there so that users can basically pay for this specific scooter. And it might even tell them, you know, this is the speed you're going, all of these kind of things. It's more of the user interaction portion of the device. Basically, one thing to note is that the e-scooter ECU plus the digital cluster in its current kind of iteration that I've shown here with a few of our older devices requires you to split up the ECU and the digital cluster between two microcontrollers. And what the 1170 brings in terms of, of flexibility is you can basically combine these two functions, the ECU and the digital cluster, into one device. So meaning we can really simplify the layout the hardware and really the cost of our design as shown here. The Cortex M4 on the 1170 can still be used for the the same exact motor control functions as before. It's just integrated on the device rather being separate from the, the digital cluster itself. So just to kind of show what sort of graphics functionality we can still maintain while basically performing the same motor control functionality, we actually have a demo that one of our partners, uh, Qt, developed that is really aimed at showing the high level of graphics functionality that this device is capable of. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so Patrick, can we dive into the graphics arena a bit? What does this system really look like? Yeah, sure. So taking a look at the the graphics system, we can really see that it is really quite complex, but really it's what enables the high level and really kind of an advanced graphics functionality we saw before. What we're looking at is a heterogeneous graphics system where we have two CSI or camera interfaces that are provided on the device. So both parallel, which is typical of the IDMX RT family, as well as a newer MIPI CSI interface, which is basically a power efficient, lower cost camera interface that was originally designed for smartphones, but we see kind of exploding as we start having cameras and all sorts of devices ranging from smart doorbells to smart cameras to really even driver assist systems, kind of a big enabler there. The really key thing to look at as well in terms of the actual graphics processing is the combination of the PXP module or pixel pipeline engine, which basically is really a graphics hardware acceleration block that can be used in combination with the 2D GPU that can provide things like an overlay GUI, but really the big thing it can provide is vector graphics. We'll cover a little bit of 
why exactly that's important in the first place. But the key thing to note is that this really offloads a lot of the processing from the CPUs and really increases throughput significantly, meaning that we can inevitably drive even a couple displays either through the, the parallel LCD interface or the MIPI DSI interfaces. It includes two LCD interface controllers as shown here. Okay, so Patrick, what about the MIPI? What does that look like in terms of the IMXRT1170? So MIPI stands for Mobile Industry Processor Interface. And really, it's a standard that was designed for, as I mentioned before, a little bit. It was low power and mobile applications. So originally, it was for smartphones. And basically, on this device, we implement all three DSI layers, which includes pixel-to-byte packing, low-level protocol, and lane management within the peripheral block. And basically, it consists of one clock lane and two data lanes. This means it also can go up to 80 megabytes to 1.5 gigabytes per second data rate in high speed mode, but it also includes a low power mode, which operates closer to 10 megabytes per second data rate. So meaning that when you need the high performance, high speed mode is there, but also if you need to do some, really to do a low power mode, which is really common in a lot of these, uh, especially in, in portable applications, and that's still available. As you can kind of imagine, with reference to the clock lane and data lanes, it's, it's really about simplifying the, the PCB design versus the parallel interfaces. Okay, vector graphics can also be a crucial element in these kinds of systems, right, Patrick? Yeah, definitely. So to kind of take a recap of, of what exactly we mean by vector graphics for those who aren't familiar, right? So vector graphics basically uses geometrical primitives. So points, lines, curves, polygons, all that kind of stuff to parametrically represent images on your screen. So meaning the difference between that and say raster graphics, which is more of a representation of images as a collection of just pixels. Really the main difference is that for vector graphics, we're just gonna look at the relationships between all of the pixels and that's what's going to define our image rather than just saying like, hey, here's a bunch of pixels. I don't really know how they relate to one another. I just know, you know what color is supposed to be in each pixel. Right. So basically what that means is that these images are a lot more flexible than those collection of pixels, which are really called bitmaps. Right. It means that we can do lossless resizing and stretching of an image. It means that it looks a lot better on devices with a higher re resolution. It also means that we can basically change the resolution of our screen without losing any sort of resolution of the graphics itself. And it also means that representation of these images often require less memory. We don't have to remember the exact value of every single pixel. We just need to remember the relationships between them, and then we can reconstruct the image from there. So not only are you getting a higher performance, just better looking graphic, which people honestly expect nowadays, you know, because we all have an amazing graphics interface on our phone that's kind of becoming the expectation for everywhere in our lives. But really, there's also no need to redesign your UI if you need to change your resolution, if you're making a new product based on your existing device. As long as you're using vector graphics, you really don't need to change the entire image itself to you know, fix the next screen. So it really gives a high degree of versatility as well as the obvious additional performance rather as shown kind of here on this graphic. Okay, cool. Now, Patrick, you also mentioned power efficiency. So what's the power story of the IMX RT1170? In terms of power, I think this is really where the Swiss army knife <laughs> analogy kind of comes into play because a large degree of the efficiency gains come from the fact that it's really a highly configurable device and has a, a wide range of power domains that you can kind of configure, right? Taking a look at the power domains a little more closely, we can kind of see that the M7 platform has its own power do domain within the SOC domain. Within that same domain, we have things like the Mega Mix, which is where you have all the audio and high-speed interfaces, the Disp Mix, which is obviously it stands for display, which is the video subsystem, basically, which includes all the components we just talked about. And then finally, we have the wake up mix, which is basically consists of a lot of your lower speed connectivity and timers and really like lower level peripherals. Then you have the LPSR domain, which contains the M4 platform. And really, this is meant to be an always on low power domain. Through this architecture, this is kind of how we achieve the low power figures I quoted before. But really, the idea is it provides a really high degree of flexibility in your design. In terms of strategies for how, how we translate this, you know, all these power domains to a low power device, 
we need to take a step back and kind of look at really what the multi-core low power strategy is going to be in general, right? So to recap for a single core system, all of the resources we were just looking at outside of the CPU, they all act according to only one CPU, right? But since this is a multi-core system, if one CPU wants to put the chip into a power mode, it must make sure that the other CPUs agree and put themselves into that state. So different resource types inevitably will be treated with different control methods, okay? And to kind of illustrate the point, we can kind of take a look at this diagram where we can see that there's a variety of power mode controls. So for example, with one CPU versus a set point, um, which we'll cover that in a little bit, but then also the second CPU mode, where we basically define what resources are private to each CPU, meaning only one CPU can control them versus what are shared, meaning both CPUs can selectively alter or configure those resources or peripherals, if you will, on the fly. And then finally, what are public resources, which means that they're basically controlled by this concept of the set point, which is really a hardware control mechanism. Okay, so Patrick, can you explain a bit more about the differences between CPU mode, set point, and standby? Yeah, sure. So to take a higher level view of it, each of those aspects, the CPU mode, the set point, and then finally the standpoint, that set of parameters is what defines a power mode. In terms of the CPU mode, it consists of several modes, which includes run, stop, wait, and suspend, the last three of which are the low power modes. And then next there's a set point. So a set point is actually a group settings for the clock and power supplies, and is really meant to be if you will, a set or a collection of all of the clock settings to enable for the variety of system buses and uh, cores. So meaning that we can basically configure up to 16 different set points, and then we can trigger movements from one set point to another based on certain events, or it can be initiated obviously in software or alternatively in hardware, depending on how you want to set up your system. Basically what this, this provides is an attainable means of going from these all these different power domains and this really this high degree of flexibility to something that you can quickly set up and transition between your different power mode states, if you will. And then finally, there's really more of the standby mechanism where basically that's as close as we can get to really kind of a low power mode when the internal bus of the device just completely stops working and the whole system is stopped and we, we only want to restart upon a wake-up source, which we kind of saw previously in the wake-up source domain or the low power domain. But all of these things collectively define a power mode definition. It really provides a high-level way of ensuring that you're able to transition between these set points without causing issues. It's still going to be a concern, but you have to worry a little bit less about how do I make sure that basically that this dual core is architecture is uh, maintained, that, that these two cores are, for lack of a better term, playing nice with one another, right? So, Badrick, security concerns are becoming a bigger and bigger issue these days. What does the IMX RT1170 bring to the table in terms of security? The IMX uh, RT1170 brings a quite substantially wide range of security features to the, the microcontroller world, if, if you will. It actually includes a full-on crypto engine that in includes uh, the CAM, which supports a variety of cryptography algorithms that really add on to what was already available in this family of devices, as well as an inline encryption engine, meaning we can encrypt data and decrypt data as it's coming in, particularly instructions to ensure the integrity of those instructions and data. And then finally, an, an OTFAD module. It also includes a random number generator. The most, I guess, interesting part of, of this particular uh, RNG module is that it is NIST compliant. Basically, it doesn't require additional software to ensure the randomness, if you will, of the random number that it generates. So typically, when you generate a random number with hardware, you would need to generate the random number, and then you would have additional algorithms basically to further, let's say, scramble that number. And you'd say like, okay, there's a ton of, they say entropy, but just means there's a ton of randomness in this number now. The RNG on this device doesn't actually need that additional software to produce a truly pseudo-random number, which really saves a lot of processing power because most of these cryptographic functions are very computationally heavy by design. Next, it also includes tamper protection, particularly active tamper protection, which we'll cover a little bit later. But basically, this provides a means of further security of protecting the device physically from people accessing it on the PCB 
or a means of, of let's say, checking whether someone is, and it includes a fail safe where basically it can wipe its own memory if it detects that there's unauthorized access to the device physically. A couple other key highlights, because I know there's a lot of information here. Basically, it also includes a high degree of key protection through the physically unclonable function key for basically generating its own chip unique secrets. So basically what that allows is basically for the device to generate its own private keys, if you will, which enables a public key asymmetric cryptographic system, right? So basically meaning that each device has its own secret key that is unique to that device, as well as a public key pair. And really it means that even if the the key of one device is somehow compromised, um, it, you can ensure that all of your other devices are are not compromised. Okay, so can we talk a bit more about the Puff technology you mentioned? So in terms of the the Puff technology, this is actually something you, a little bit unique to NXP and the, and also somewhat to this device as well. And how that unclonable key is is generated, or I should say, how that <laughs> that private key is generated through the physically unclonable function. So this end result that a secret key is uniquely generated and really only known by the chip kind of follows a four-step process, right? So first, there's a high degree of process variation when actually manufacturing these devices, right? And it includes uh, attributes really of the transistors on the device. So it could be things like the length, the width, and the thickness of these transistors. These variations don't cause typically any, let's say, performance issues on the device, but they just happen to be different. Kind of like snowflakes fall from the sky and they all are kind of the same. They're snowflakes, but they're all supposedly a little bit different. And all of these transistors are in SRAM, by the way, in, in terms of this device. So each time the SRAM starts up, it will power on all of those cells and they'll come up as either a one or a zero, right? Because that's what transistors are. They're just ones or zeros. Basically what happens is through the variations in the process technology itself of when the chips are fabricated, you're allowed to create, let's say, a silicon fingerprint, if you will, based on those startup values, because they are basically random, but also repeatable and unique to each chip. Finally, we use this physically unclonable function to derive a secret key from that silicon fingerprint that builds the entire foundation of a security subsystem. And so the key really benefits of that is that it's device unique. Really, it's a non-reproducible fingerprint. It leverages the entropy or randomness of the manufacturing process itself. So it's really something that is quite impossible to replicate, if you will. And then finally, there's no key material programmed on the device. So there's no way for people to actually access that key. Okay, so if my audience wants more information, Patrick, where should they go? Uh, I went ahead and kind of collected a few resources that you can find on nxp.com. Uh, includes the device series webpage, which is nxp.com slash imxrt1170. You can also check out some of the software and tools showing how to use the device on nxp.com slash mcuexpresso. And then even you can even find the community where you can ask more questions on community.nxp.com. I also included some additional video that uh, some might be interested in, and it included a little QR code in case this uh, URL was a little bit too long to, to follow. But yeah, I'd say these are the best places to find resources or where people should check for more information or even demos or evaluation boards for the device. Fantastic. Well, Patrick, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>